You ever wonder why it is that the kids in school who seem to have the most potential never really seem to make anything of themselves in life? There's a good reason for that. If Kierkegaard is right, it's because too much potential freezes us up. If you could be a successful doctor and lawyer and politician and screenwriter, but you have to choose one and give up the others in order to succeed, you probably won't do anything because you are afraid of losing the possibility of the others. When you can be anything, you do nothing. If you don't limit yourself by choosing one, you get nothing. Or conversely, maybe you try to do it all. You try to actualize all your potential, but since you're not Leonardo freaking Da Vinci, you do it poorly. And that's what Wonder Woman 1984 did. It tried to do too much. It's a behemoth two and a half hour film with three major plots centering around three major conflicts. First you have the story of Barbara Minerva, an unpopular adult woman who is overlooked and underappreciated by everyone at work. And despite being an adult woman who's no longer in high school, she wants to be just as popular, confident, and attractive as her co-worker Diana Prince. As luck would have it, she wishes upon a magic rock and does become just like Diana, becoming a veritable superhero it girl overnight. Hijinks ensue. The second plot revolves around Wonder Woman herself wishing upon that same magic rock to have her long-dead boyfriend Steve Trevor back from the dead. Lo and behold, he does come back, and hijinks ensue, a la Crocodile Dundee. The third plot revolves around the villain, played by Pedro Pascal, wishing upon the same magic rock to become the magic rock in order to gain unlimited power. Hijinks ensue, a la Bruce Almighty. We're left with a movie that's trying to be a glow-up story, a romance, a fish-out-of-water story, and a ring of power story all at the same time. None of the plots are done well, even though, in my opinion, they all have great potential, and each story could have made for a better film if only it had been the sole focus of the film. For example, you could focus on Barbara's story. It's the classic Paradise Lost story. The good guy Lucifer becoming evil because he envies the more popular, powerful son of God or the Frankenstein monster becoming evil because he feels like a social outcast. What's different about Barbara's story, however, is that unlike Lucifer or Frankenstein's monster, she does become popular. She does become as powerful and attractive as Wonder Woman. This story could have been a nice counterpoint to the recent Joker film, which does essentially rehash the old Frankenstein plot. Joker becomes a monster because he is not accepted by society. But Barbara is the opposite. She is accepted and does become popular and successful. Yet she still becomes a monster. It's an interesting idea. That story is new and refreshing and it has potential. And it'd be great to see that being a superhero is not all that it's cracked up to be. Show us that if you could be Wonder Woman, you might not want to be her. And they actually came really close to doing this. Ever since the first film, my biggest beef with the Wonder Woman character has been that she's bland. She has no major weaknesses, no serious moral problems. And it seems like she has no strong desires. There's nothing that she can't live without. But for a split second in this film, we are given a glimpse of what she really wants. She wants Steve Trevor. Nothing else has come close to making her happy. There's so much potential in this film for exploring loneliness and loss and grief and unwillingness to move on. Diana's wish to bring Steve back from the dead is the superhero equivalent of Hitchcock's vertigo that I need in my life. And Patty Jenkins sets this up so perfectly by having Trevor come back not in his own body, but in another man's body, which raises the questions of identity and manipulation and ambiguity that Vertigo is based on, but with a fresh spin and a completely new scenario. Instead of filming the man who Steve Trevor comes back in as he objectively appears, Jenkins films him from Diana's perspective. We see Chris Pine, not the other dude. We, like Diana, are only able to see Steve Trevor. We're unable to see what's objectively there. Sure, they probably did this just to have Chris Pine back, with all of his movie marketing potential, but there's so much potential in this setup for a profound exploration of perception and consciousness and the way love changes how we see and how love ends in tragedy. Not to be a Debbie Downer, but love is unavoidably tragic. Ernest Hemingway, the crown prince and heir to the throne of Debbie Downers, said that if two people love each other, there can be no happy end to it. There is no lonelier man in death than the man who has lived many years with a good wife and then outlived her. This is exactly the situation Diana is in. The tragedy of outliving by decades the only man she has ever loved. This Wonder Woman is a fundamentally tragic figure, but thus far no one wants to explore the misery and existential crisis of being Wonder Woman. They just want Wonder Woman to be a spectacle. The powers that be want to make Wonder Woman a feminist icon whose only troubles come from outside her, not from within. It's verboten to entertain the idea that an empowered woman 
is a tragic figure, which is a shame because a tragic Wonder Woman would be Oscar material. The DC Universe is always at its best when it sinks into realism. Joker was powerful because it dealt with real issues like mental illness and delinquency. It made Joker uncomfortably real. And I for one wouldn't mind seeing an uncomfortably real Wonder Woman who is jaded, broken by grief, and addicted to antidepressants. At any rate, if the film had only focused on Diana's relationship with Steve, it would have been a significantly better film. Unfortunately, Wonder Woman had to share her own film with two other character plots, so we really don't get to feel her feelings. We don't get to see her face a strong moral dilemma. We don't see her wrestle with the choice of whether to sacrifice her powers for the person she loves, or to sacrifice the person she loves in order to save the world. We didn't get to see a Wonder Woman without her powers, even though we were teased in that direction. We didn't get to see her engaging in any challenging problem solving in order to outwit her opponent, at least not until the very climax of the film. And here I'll give it to the writers, this is one of the great things about this movie. I'm glad Wonder Woman defeated the villain not by brute strength but by hijacking and converting him. This was always the Achilles heel of the Marvel films. A point made by this guy, Dr. Paul Maxwell, on the very academic Twitter. The Avengers defeat Thanos by brute strength, they don't defeat his ideology. For all we know, Thanos was morally in the right, and the Avengers were in the wrong, but Wonder Woman actually defeats the villain by defeating his reasoning and his morality and converting him. The problem is that she does so in only like five minutes, so the villain's redemption just feels unearned. It's too immediate, too cheaply bought. The idea of simply changing a wish so easily and immediately not wanting something that you did want is just counterintuitive. It's psychologically unrealistic, especially when it's so bogged down in a character that's become so morally corrupt. Redemption takes time. We can maybe believe that someone can change over the course of a single intense night, as with Ebenezer Scrooge, which I made a video on, but even that's a stretch. We certainly don't expect a villain to completely halt the momentum he's had through the whole movie, stop on a dime, and change in as little as two minutes. Kierkegaard teaches us that the things we truly wish for aren't the same as flippant desires or momentary cravings. Changing wishes is not as easy as changing clothes. Wishes stem from the very core of our being. In the wish, we are totally ourselves, and the wish is the most accurate representation of our inner being. The wish, aided by possibility, flatteringly beguiles us to disclose ourselves entirely as we really are, beguiles us to look exactly like ourselves. If it's true that our wishes flow out of our innermost beings, then we can't expect anyone to renounce their wishes or change what they want in a single moment. Elsewhere, Kierkegaard makes the point that repentance or personal transformation takes time. It has to be slowly kneaded into us or maybe forcibly beaten out of us, but it is never sudden or hasty. Experience teaches us that to repent at once is not always even the right time to repent because in this moment of haste, when the engaged thoughts and various passions are still busily in motion or at least tensed in their relaxation, repentance can so easily be mistaken about what really should be repented, can so easily confuse itself with the opposite, with momentary remorse, with a painful tormenting worldly grief, or a desperate pulling apart within itself that's not true repentance. Momentary repentance is very dubious. It might only be a momentary feeling, Sudden repentance doesn't really want change. It just wants to collect all the bitterness of sorrow in one draft and then be off. It wants to get away from the guilt, away from every reminder of it. It doesn't want to become better as a person. It just wants the guilt to be completely forgotten with the passage of time. And this is exactly what the film does. It quickly brushes over the guilt of the villain and he faces no consequences, which is ironic. The major theme of the film is that you can't take shortcuts. Unearned power is dangerous. Immediate popularity costs you your humanity. You can't get what you want immediately and not lose part of yourself. Don't take shortcuts. But ironically, the film itself takes shortcuts. With all of its plot points, it tries to tell its story without the sufficient number of scenes and lines and time that are needed for the story to be told. My major criticism of the film can be summed up by its own most poignant line. I wish we had more time.